Reader's Digest invites people to send in uh, humorous little anecdotes. A man named Alan Israel, it's not hard to guess what his heritage is, sent in this little story. He said, during basic training, our drill sergeant asked all Jewish personnel to make themselves known. Six of us tentatively raised our hand. Much to our relief, we were given the day off for Rosh Hashanah. A few days later, in anticipation of Yom Kippur, the sergeant again asked for all Jewish personnel to identify themselves. This time, every soldier raised his hand. The sergeant declared only those who were Jewish last week can be Jewish this week. <laughs> but it makes a sim simple but important point. Some people are religious out of conviction and some out of convenience. The first group prefers one kind of religious leader and the second group prefers another. There are institutions led by those that cater to the group who do not want their religion interfering with their lives. But such an organization will never make a profit. So let me set the context for one of the most important texts, I believe, in the book of Amos. It's the only narrative passage in the book. Amos, as you recall, was a shepherd, a keeper of fig trees in a town outside of Tekoa, which is a small town in Judah. He lived in the days of the divided kingdom. The ten northern tribes called Israel had apostatized and they had gone under the influence of wicked kings. They were not following the true ways of the one true God. So God raised up prophets like Isaiah and Micah and Hosea and Amos to go and preach and woo Israel back to the one true God. So Amos is from Judah in the south and he is sent to Israel in the north. Now, the northern kings, starting with Jeroboam I, knew that if the people go down to Jerusalem to worship, their hearts would eventually be drawn back to the kings of the south. So they set up places of worship in the northern kingdom, places like Bethel and Gilgal and Shiloh. And they would say to the people, you don't have to go all the way down to Jerusalem to worship God. You can go to these places in your own country and worship there. So when Amos goes then to the northern kingdom, it only makes sense that he would go to the city where the people were gathering to worship. So with that as the background... Let's read together from chapter 7, beginning in the 10th verse. Follow along in your own Bible. It says this. And Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword. And Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there. Do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. And you say, Do not prophesy against Israel. Stop preaching against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. 
Your land will be measured up and divided and you yourself will die in a pagan country. And Israel will certainly go into exile away from their native land. Now, who is Amaziah? While he was the chief of staff at the royal chapel. Bethel meant something in those days. If we said Camp David, everyone would know that's where our presidents go for getaways. And in that day, if you said Bethel, everyone would say, well, that's where our king goes to worship. So Amaziah is the number one person in the number one sanctuary in the land. And you got to understand, this is a political appointment. His purpose is to legitimize the existing monarchy. It's a plum job. And he didn't get it by preaching about the problems in Israel. The king would come to Bethel, and he would never hear a sermon from Amaziah about injustice or corruption or greed. Amaziah's job was to be a vocal defender of the status quo, and he had no intention of letting Amos upset his very well-run organization. So he did two things that people always do when they want to discredit a preacher. First, he misrepresented Amos. This is a common tactic against prophets. You say that they said things they did not say, and then you take things that they did say out of context. Notice he said, Amos is preaching that you are going to die by the sword, Jeroboam. Amos never said that. At least, it's not recorded that he said that, and I don't believe that he ever said that because he's a prophet, and Jeroboam did not die by the sword. According to 2 Kings 14, Jeroboam died of natural causes. Amos never said a word about that. But that's what you do to discredit a prophet. You say that he said things that he never said, and then you notice he never mentions the reason that Amos announced judgment on Israel. He did pronounce judgments on Israel, but he did so for reasons that Amaziah conveniently forgot to mention. So the first thing he did was misrepresent Amos, and the second thing that he did was he prohibited Amos. He prohibited him from prophesying at the royal chapel. That's how you shut up preachers that bother you. You misquote them, and then you tell them, you can't preach here anymore. So Amaziah said, you just need to go back down to Judah and make your money preaching down there. This land can't bear all your words. Now sadly, the land can almost always bear the words of establishment religion. That's why I think it is very significant when you study the history of revival. Revival is almost always never sparked by the leaders of religious organizations. Because renewal is seen as a threat to their vested interest. Prophets tend to threaten prophets. So he says, go back to the land of Judah, do your prophesying there. But Amos countered the go of Amaziah with an even stronger go. Amos said, I don't do this for money. I don't, I didn't go to prophet school. I don't have a degree in this. I'm a shepherd. But God took me and God said, go to Israel. And his go trumps your go. In other words, Amos said, I don't pick what and I don't pick where I preach. Amos spoke for one reason. He had been spoken to. His motive wasn't to be loved. His motive was to be obedient. His desire was not to be paid. It was to be heard. Now these two men represent two models of ministry. Preaching as a job and preaching as a calling. Which model is most prevalent today? We saw last time that God 
finally had enough of Amaziah's ministry. And in chapter 8, verse 11, he announced, The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And that doesn't mean that if you went to the temples at Bethel or Gilgal or Shiloh that you couldn't hear men preach. But God was saying he wouldn't show up in their preaching. There would be no more word from God in the land. You know, the Quakers are known for their commitment to nonviolence. One particular man had his house robbed over and over and a friend said to him you need to get a gun in fact he gave him a gun and he said just take this to keep your family safe and he said i would never use this gun but just keep it his friend insisted well two weeks later he hears noises in the middle of the night downstairs he goes down and he interrupts a robbery he takes that gun And he points it right at the thief and he says to him, Friend, I would do thee no harm, but thou art standing where I'm about to shoot. (laughs) Listen, I am about to shoot. What's about to follow is a, a very passionate argument for prophetic preaching. But what I am saying is not aimed at you. This church has never muzzled me. In fact, the elders of this church have never once said that I could not preach what I thought the word of God said. Years ago, they all received a letter at the same time from an individual. And that individual asked my elders outright to tell me to stop preaching what I was preaching. They came to me, they met with me, and they said... Keep it up. But you need to know that there are churches all over America that attack prophetic preaching. So with this sermon going to be on the Internet, it's going to go all over for everybody that listens, for everybody that watches. You are standing about where I'm going to shoot. I'm going to share with you four reasons why I believe the Amaziah model of ministry is trumping the Amos model of ministry today. First, the influence of secularism. I believe our land and many of our churches are losing the notion of having a word from God. Secularism is robbing us of a sense of mystery and of transcendence. And what is popular today in our churches is what I call the sharing model, where we don't believe God has actually gifted certain men to stand up and bring a word from God. So we all sit in a circle and we say, well, this is what the Bible means to me. Amos did not show up at Bethel to share. He showed up to declare a word he had received from the Lord. And the question that I believe we have got to ask ourselves is, do we still believe that God speaks to his people through chosen servants? You see, a sermon is not necessarily a word from God just because some guy stands up in a pulpit and he quotes some Bible verses. Amaziah can preach just like that. Biblical preaching is preaching anointed by God where the text is open and the people are brought into an encounter with the living God. And there is a lot of preaching today That leaves God out. Jeremiah 23 verses 16 and 18 says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard His word. 
There is some understanding in the Bible that to preach a message of God, you have spent time with God and you've heard something from God. The sad fact is preaching has become a craft that men learn how to do very well, whether or not they know God. Paul Cedar, well-known Christian author, says that a young man, uh, as a young man, he was interviewed for this youth ministry position, and he was immensely qualified. He was a good speaker. He was articulate. He was very charismatic. He had all the tools but he never forgets the best counsel he got from one of the elders in the interview. The elder said, you, you have one problem that really concerns me. And Paul said, well, what's that? He said, I believe you have enough talent to pull this off by yourself. And that concerns me. It is possible to craft well-received sermons week after week after week and not even know God. I've known too many men that after they were done preaching, gave up preaching, they didn't even attend church anymore because it was a job and not a calling. But it is impossible to spend time with the Almighty to be slain by his message in your own life and not repeat what you have heard. Another reason the Amaziah model is, is trumping the Amos model today is the influence of materialism. Did you notice what Amaziah said to Amos? He said, go make your bread somewhere else. He assumes that Amos is in the ministry for money, which tells you more about Amaziah than it does Amos. Amaziah was not the first preacher for sale, nor the last. The buying and selling of preachers is still a very active industry. Amos was in Bethel because of a call, not a promotion. There cannot be a genuine word from the Lord by a man whose convictions and whose courage is shaped by his wallet. Because here's what will happen. The, the question, have I just received a word from God, will always get trumped by how are they going to react when they hear this? Now, it's not just preachers who are guilty here. It's churches, too. Churches who hijack the pulpit with the threat of monetary withdrawal. I have known too many preachers who have preached faithfully through many years, but let them preach one sermon that irritates that one or two families with the deepest pockets, and all of a sudden, all those years of faithful ministry are forgotten, and he is fired. Because the people with the deepest pockets decide what the pulpit can say. And listen, if we're going to give the pulpit to hirelings, we should expect a famine of the word. Another reason why the Amaziah model is trumping the Amos model is the influence of professionalism. Now, I believe in academic and practical training for ministry. I, I wouldn't have a degree from a Christian college if I did not believe that that was something that was important. But I am concerned about a trend that I have noticed growing. Too many churches today want men like Amaziah, polished, educated, efficient managers without ever discovering if the man really even knows God or not. Look at some of the publications that are trying to hire preachers and just see what it is that they say that they want. I took some time this past week to go to my alma mater's site and look at all of the open ministry positions. And of the 45 different listings they had, not one of them asked a question of whether or not the candidate interested in the position loved Jesus. Or God. 
Now, they said a lot about his academic requirements and his administrative skills and his leadership abilities and his relationship skills, but nothing about his love for the Lord. I, I came across this some time ago. I think it's worth reading to you. It was written by a man named Mike Iaconelli, who is a giant in the youth ministry field. And the context was a friend of his was looking for a preaching position after years of being an associate minister. And he had asked Mike if he would be a reference for him. So Mike had, had actually fielded a number of phone calls. And this was his observation. He writes, the past few months I've been called by six or seven churches asking for my recommendation. This process takes one or two hours on the phone. And I've spent close to 20 hours on the phone answering questions from churches regarding my friend's qualification for a senior pastorate. Last week, I was thinking about those conversations, and I was wondering how my friend was doing, and something very disturbing occurred to me. Not a single church asked, does your friend love Jesus? Does he love God? Is he a follower of Christ? Not one. I had to bring it up myself. By the way, you might be interested to know that my friend, the man that you're thinking about calling, loves Jesus. He really does love God. And the response was always the same. Oh, good. But how about his administration skills? Apparently, it is no longer important whether a minister loves Jesus. What's important are a minister's administration skills and leadership skills and relationship skills, etc. ad nauseum. I wonder what would happen if the only qualification for ministry was a love for Jesus and a passion for God and a longing for intimacy with the Savior. We don't want ministers anymore. We want CEOs. We don't want prophets. We want politicians. We don't want godliness. We want experience. We don't want spirituality. We want efficiency. We don't want humility. We want charisma. We don't want godly authority. We want good relational skills. And as a result, we have thousands upon thousands of churches in America whose ministers are qualified to do what the church has asked of them. But the one thing that hasn't been asked of them is to love Jesus. So they don't. And neither do their people. People today are more interested in what degree you have than how much you pray. They're more concerned with how efficient you are as a manager than by how much you actually love your wife. They care more about how articulate you are than by how committed you are to Jesus. Let's face it, the Amaziah model runs a much more efficient organization. And in too many churches today, Amaziah's credentials are very valuable. But the boldness of an Amos does not come from a pedigree. It comes from a call. One more shot. The influence of institutionalism. Now an institution is hard to define because it can be a church, it can be a school, it can be a ministry or a parachurch ministry, it can be some big Christian event, it can even be a brotherhood or a denomination. But what all institutions have in common is a commitment to self-preservation. And consequently, advancement of the institution becomes more important than advancement of the truth. Amaziah did not care whether or not Amos' message was from God. It was hurting the operation. And the preservation of the operation is job number one. Institutions fear prophets because prophets upset the status quo. And so those who run institutions will ask questions like this. Is this going to hurt our attendance? Is this going to affect our weekly offerings? How is our enrollment going to suffer because of this? Institutions and their leaders feel much more comfortable with Amaziah 
And two concerns will always govern institutional preaching. First, matters that the institution deems threatening are avoided regardless of their truthfulness. This is why many churches avoid issues like abortion or marriage or anything deemed political. Doesn't matter if it's true. It doesn't matter if it is a needed message. If it upsets the institution, it's not allowed. Secondly, matters that the institution deems important to its constituency are emphasized regardless of their relevancy. Whatever keeps the institution's doors open are going to be emphasized regardless of how relevant those matters are. And I can get in big trouble here. What do we typically get caught up in discussing? Issues that have absolutely no relevancy to billions of lost people. But the issues are very important to the few people with the money in the institutions. Institutions tend to stone prophets. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 23. He rebuked the Pharisees for building these beautiful monuments to murdered prophets. And then they turn around and murder prophets in their own generation. The Amoses of God will typically challenge and even threaten the way things have always been. The Amaziahs of the world are just a lot easier to live with, especially if profit margin is the bottom line. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is do we want Amaziah interpreting scripture for us or someone else? You see, I believe that there is no more consequential sin than that of faithless preaching. Maybe I'm biased because I'm a preacher. I'm not saying that all sin is not evil or heinous to God, but I am saying that some sins have greater consequences than other sins. And when the people of God hear faithless, empty, institutional preaching, a famine of the word of the Lord comes. And the consequences can last for generations. It did in Israel. Forty years later, the nation tragically discovered which man, Amaziah or Amos, was telling the truth. A nation realized too late the value of of raising profits. My message today has a very clear agenda. I call on our church, I call on every church that would hear this message to be more patient, to be more understanding, to be more supportive of the prophets that God sends in our midst. Which model of ministry are we actually going to pass on to the next generation? We will not have prophetic preaching unless we insist on it. Brothers and sisters, let's insist on it. Let's insist on prophetic preaching.